Next on Lectures in History, Weber State University professor Brandon Little teaches a class about military vehicle innovations and the role of American factories during World War II. He focuses on types of amphibious vehicles used in the Pacific and describes the process of testing, production, and battle application. Well, good morning, class, and welcome back to History 3290, Modern American Military History. And today, we are going to continue our conversation about the Second World War. And specifically, we're going to look at an aspect of the war through what we could call the lens of industrial mobilization. And industrial mobilization is often understood as a key to Allied victory in, in this war. It's often said that the Allies win because they outproduce the Axis powers. And I'm sure many of us have heard this before and perhaps encountered it, you've read it. Um, but one of the problems with that line of reasoning is that if it's simply amount of stuff that produces victory, well, at the beginning of this war, the Axis powers possess more. And so that argument about stuff cannot absolutely establish ultimately the trajectory of Allied victory. Because the Allies, for a long time, are deficient in that quantity of stuff. Uh, the other aspect of the material argument, if you will, the, the, that the Allies outproduce, that's understated and oversimplified in almost all literature that you could consider related to the war, is that we have no clear sense of how this stuff is built. Now, there are historians of technology who write about particular kinds of technology, but most of the, the discussions of, of war assume that technology is built. The arrival of weapon systems on, on scene, the aircraft that fly over, there's, or, or the landing craft that arrive on shore, uh, we just assume that they're built. And we have very little intricate understanding of these processes uh, that would ultimately, as I would ask, uh, translate strategic requirements into battlefield weaponry. It's a much more elaborate process than we've often considered. And so today, our goal is to then look at an, an aspect of industrial mobilization specifically through a case study that I've investigated quite extensively uh, in Navy and Marine Corps archives as well as other collections to understand how one particular vehicle, which you see on screen, this amphibian tractor, as it was called, how that was built for the purpose of fighting and winning not only World War II, but specifically World War II in the Pacific. And this is one particular model, uh, and, and in the backdrop you see a battleship blazing away as troops are being uh, conveyed ultimately uh, to uh, Japanese-held shores on Iwo Jima near the end of, of the war in the Pacific. And it's my argument that this amphibian tractor, humble little box that it was, would ultimately prove indispensable to victory in the Pacific. It's the singular vehicle that could actually deliver American troops ashore along many coral-fringed islands that the Japanese possessed in World War II. So if you couldn't get ashore, you can't fight and win if you're an American soldier or American strategic planner. And so I want us to examine this particular case study. It, the Amtrak, as I'd argue, is the pivot around which Allied victory turned in the Pacific. And so we'll consider this, and to borrow from this notion of, of the Hobbit a little bit, or there and back again, um, we're going to be looking at what we could call from the factory to the front lines, this process whereby folks in the home front, in the Navy Department, in the, in the Headquarters Marine Corps, would be working in concert with industry to actually build war-specific material. And then to figure out how it works, and to translate those challenges and problems, deficiencies and possibilities into revised vehicle designs, revised operational concepts, and ultimately we'll see that there's a dialogue between the folks at home and the folks overseas. By way of historiography, a term that we're already familiar with, but just to reiterate briefly, for our purposes, we could consider historiography the writing of history. And what I would characterize much of the rioting about World War II is establishing what we could call a tyranny of the assembly line. What I mean by that is we almost always, when we see pictures of assembly lines, assume that's where everything's built. And we've seen many pictures like this, I'm sure, where, where there are assembly uh, lines for, uh, for aircraft that are being built, heavy bombers, for example, or tanks, or in this case, landing craft on, on the left of the screen. <coughs> 
The bias is toward presuming that everything that's important in terms of industrial mobilization really happens there on the factory floor. Now I want to complicate that a bit today. The other part of this historiographical omission, or this lens toward simplification, is that we assume that things are built. And we see pictures of them. We know that they were built. And so often we read war back as inevitable. We read this process of construction as as logical, as, as necessary. And we often assume that things will be built. The next model will be better than the previous model. It's just obvious that it would be that way. But in reality, we'll find that uh, in our case study today, there's nothing inevitable whatsoever about the military construction of an amphibian tractor. Nothing whatsoever. So in other words, it's up to a variety of factors, contingent forces, and what historians like to call agents, individuals involved in these processes. So let's consider how and where, uh, where the Amtrak would be built. But I've, I've given you a handout already, uh, and on the top slide, it indicates basically these questions here. And these are some of the questions that illuminate this process of, of what I find we're missing in this story of industrial mobilization. And often, what we overlook are the people involved in these processes that make critical decisions to build or to not to build, when to build, what to build, as well as the organizations charged with determining uh, such, uh, such issues as where to build, what to build, and how to build it. One of the big questions that starts this process is simply who envisioned the strategic requirements? Such as in the war, envisioned war with the Pacific. We, we all know well already that, that American war planners, especially in the Navy and the Marine Corps, were long anticipating war with Japan from the early 20th century. So what do you need in order to accomplish your strategy? What, are the, what technologies might you require? Whether it be ships or, or transports or landing craft or, in this particular case, an amphibian tractor. Who determines what's needed? It d- depends in part on what they, their imagination and creativity is and also what the realm of the possible seems to be. Another question is involved in what we call opportunity costs who would reconcile what we could, what economists often call opportunity costs. And as, as awkward as a phrase as opportunity cost is, we are all familiar with the basic premise. And that is, if you choose to do something, you forego the opportunity to do something else. By virtue of being in class today, you're not out snowboarding. Uh, and, and whether that's a good decision, I can't say. Uh, but nonetheless, um, in military terms, back in, say, the planning for World War II and, it, and during the war itself, There are a host of decisions made. If you build this, you might not be able to build something else. And so we have to figure out who makes those decisions of what to build and when not to. Um, Related to this process of industrial construction, and say that assembly line that we saw a picture of a moment ago, the assembly line is invariably where what we call the, the Navy called the prime contractor. That is the final assembly center. The assembly line were things that are already built in other locations, such as the transmission, the radiator, uh, the brakes, the machine guns, are manufactured in other plants. By whom? Subcontractors. And in the case of the amphibian tractor, there would literally be hundreds of subcontractors for this particular vehicle. And frankly, it's no different for the tank or any variety of tank or aircraft. There's prime contractors that assemble these things together, uh, ultimately for use eventually, uh, but, uh, but there's dozens if not hundreds of subcontractors building the, the constituent parts and then relaying them, usually on rail, to the final assembly center. And before the subcontractors even build things, they often need raw materials. Where do you get the copper, the steel, and all of these essential ingredients to manufacture the brake pads or the, or the, the boxes or the, uh, the steel frame for the amphibian tractor? Where does it come from? Know that ultimately this question of, of sourcing and supply and the process, the steps of building, is a vastly elaborate and intricate. And how much harder in an era without the conveniences of, say, uh, computing technology? People had to make phone calls and write a host of letters. Just by way of example, the Navy's Bureau of Ships, which was responsible, the agency responsible for building the amphibian tractor, for every week of the war, every week of the war, 
there's a folder, a dossier, a jacket of more than an inch of written correspondence back and forth between the Navy and its ancillary organizations, uh, between contractors, subcontractors, and all sorts of interested parties. That's for every week of the war. And so you could imagine this vast sea of communications required to build something, in one sense, relatively simple, a vehicle. We'd think it would be simple. But it's being built at precisely the same time as a host of other war urgent materials and pro- programs are, are competing for priorities also. You might imagine battleship construction or aircraft carrier construction necessitates certain materials that the Amtrak could make use of, or aircraft or tanks. Who determines who gets what and in what priority? Those are essential ca- questions that we rarely consider. Now with respect to this notion of procurement, of acquiring things, One of the key terms in this era was bottlenecks. Bottleneck, bottleneck, bottleneck. There are all these choke points at which construction could be derailed for want of a nail, you could say, or for want of a ball bearing or a critical component. If certain parts don't arrive on time, that vehicle doesn't get built or finished. And so maybe you could complete 90% of it, but if you don't have the other essential components because maybe a factory wasn't able to provide them, for want of enough labor, skilled labor, or enough machine tools, or enough raw materials, for any of those reasons, or all of them, this particular contraption might not actually roll off the assembly line and reach forces in the field. Those challenges were ones that all the war services in all of the warring countries would have to to reconcile. Some do it better than others, we believe. The United States will do it quite well, as complex as it is, And part of the reason it is able to do it a little better is because the homeland is not being blasted to smithereens, as in the case of parts of Britain, or certainly Germany, or Japan, or Russia. The image in the upper right here is just a a small screenshot of, of correspondence from the chief of the Bureau of Ships. This agency challenged with building Navy, uh, Navy material, warships and such small things as this tractor. And it's informing uh, its constituent uh, parts, basically, that ultimately Food Machinery Corporation, which will be introduced to shortly, this prime contractor charged with constructing en masse this amphibian tractor, is not going to deliver according to schedule. They have problems afoot, and they need to resolve them. But time and time again, this question of bottlenecks appears as contractors were uh, unable to meet the the voracious appetites uh, of of the armed services for various specialized equipment. Another kind of question that's related to the building of, say, a tank or an airplane or, or a landing craft or vehicle is who determines how it's going to be used and to which structure does it fit? What's the doctrine that animates its use? How do the services, say if the, in the case of a, maybe a Marine Corps craft, how does the Navy understand its use? Are the Navy and Marine Corps relationships going to be formed in ways that you could actually make optimal use of this contraption rather than have problems that, that, that create great inefficiencies and maybe death on the battlefield? There's a host of people uh, at work in these, uh, trying to resolve these questions. How do you train a, somebody to drive a tank or an airplane or an amphibian tractor? What does that involve? What kinds of manuals do you need? Driver's manuals, if you will. Who takes the pictures of the, of the, of the, of the arrangement of the, of the console, say on the dash, where the, the gauges are? Such simple things as photo- photographing and, and building operations manuals is part of this process of industrial mobilization. Because if you don't have trained crews, they don't know how to work these things. And so from the minutia of such things as a manual to the greater complexity of of building and mass, uh, all of these questions come into to bear when we're considering industrial mobilization. And of course, if there are problems, who resolves them? And at what pace? Can they be resolved? Are they they decisions that, that need to be made at the highest levels? Are these decisions made at lower levels? Who's responsible? All of these questions surface uh, in the arena of mobilization. So thinking about that, let's take a a big picture approach and we'll consider first a series of requirements 
And then we'll work into a series of what we could call production challenges or the production puzzle. And then uh, we'll, we'll examine certain vignettes in what we could call deployment. But starting first with requirements. The big picture part of the puzzle is that ultimately the US Navy and Marine Corps identified that they would have to cross the Pacific Ocean in event of war with Japan. The expectation, as we've identified in previous classes, was that the American surface fleet would sail westward, engage the Japanese Navy, and hopefully destroy it. Of course, we call that war plan orange, ultimately. Part and parcel to this big picture approach of crossing the Pacific was something that the US Marine Corps studied intensely, and this was the problem of, of bases, basing infrastructure. How do you defend bases such as Guam, Wake, Midway, the Philippines, when you expect the Japanese forces are probably going to conquer them. How do you defend them? So the Marines studied a, this problem of advanced base defense for, for the early part of the 20th century, especially in the 19 teen, up to the teens, and then they really start to reorient a little bit toward what we call amphibious assault. Not simply defending your own base, which you've probably lost, but fighting to get it back or fighting to conquer new territory. That process of amphibious assault is a critical one that the Marines will elaborate upon. And we talked about Pete Ellis as one of these uh, pivotal figures in the early 1920s. But one of the critical problems was how do you get your forces ashore? From ship to shore. With combat power, I might add. Not simply rowing your way ashore on a leisure cruise or a pleasure cruise, but you've got to fight your way ashore. In the age of the machine gun, and the British had already discovered in World War I the problems with confronting a heavily fortified beach. Uh, in this particular case, a, a battle called Gallipoli. Uh, the, the British discovered to their dismay that rowboats don't work well in the age of the machine gun. And the problem for the Marine Corps, well into the 1930s, is they pretty much have rowboats. So realizing that the technology that they possessed would not permit them to to actually accomplish their mission was a glaring source of concern to all of the Marines studying these problems of the Pacific in the early 20th century. And I've got in, in, in focused a, a little uh, in, in, um, inset picture here of an island or a cluster of islands, a coral atoll called ultimately Tarawa. And in the bottom left corner is this little tiny island called Beisho or Bedio. People pronounce it differently. Uh, but this little tiny island would prove absolutely uh, important for the, the, the testing of amphibious assault techniques uh, and to the progression of American forces across the Pacific. But in anticipation of that, how do you cross a coral reef at low tide if there's a low tide? If you've had boats, they're going to run af afoul onto, on the coral. And the coral probably in many places stretches 400 to 800 yards wide. Have you ever run in a bathtub or, or, or in a swimming pool? How slow that process is? And imagine the challenge of climbing out of a, of, a, of a landing craft onto a coral reef in which it still is going to have some water on it, and these are ocean currents, I might add, and then having to lumber across the coral reef, drop into the lagoon, which might actually be, say, somewhere in the realm of eight feet deep, right off the reef. Drop into that with a pack and a rifle, and somehow manage to hold your breath while you're wading ashore. And as you wade ashore with, with the water as it's receding, uh, you're getting shot at uh, by, by, by machine guns, by mortars, and other kinds of weaponry. It's a recipe for disaster. And so aware of this tactical challenge to cross coral reefs, alerted the Marines to try and study this problem. The challenge for them was they weren't able to convince the Navy that this was a problem. And so we'll see how that works now. So we could pose this question. How would the Navy and the Marine Corps reconcile their opportunity costs and their resource constraints to meet these requirements for mechanized amphibious assault? We'll know that after World War I concludes, and we talked about the Washington Conference and how the US Navy was restricted by treaty regulations and re prohibitions on, on how big the, the surface fleet could really be. Well, in the midst of that budgetarily austere environment, where the Navy is appreciating how much is evaporating uh, out of their hands <laughs> in terms of warship tonnage. The Navy was, or the Marine Corps was approached uh, by an industrial designer. We've highlighted him in another class named Walter Christie, and he built this amphibian tank on his own dime with the hopes of securing war contracts. And there you see a Marine testing it in the Caribbean 
in the early 1920s. And the Marine Corps would have loved to buy one, but for want of a nail, for want of a dollar. The Navy at this precise moment was not inclined to spend any money whatsoever on the Marine Corps, especially on a, an innovative, unproven uh, box, ultimately. And so the Marines had to turn down this opportunity to build what they thought might actually provide them a means of defense, as well as to create some firepower to roll their forces ashore. They had great hopes for it. Note that they weren't building it themselves. An industrial designer on his own dime had come up with it. Would the Navy rather build ships like the Arizona? You bet. And so in that era, very much, Marine Corps appropriations, budgetary programs or new types of programs were subjected to ultimately Navy whims. Just like Walter Christie, another industrial designer, an innovator who's actually not looking to make a buck because he's already rich. His name was Donald Roebling. And we can see him in the inset in the middle. Uh, he's got the, the dark pants on uh, close to the, the fellow in the white. Um, but here we have a couple different designs that Roebling had built. Uh, prototypes of what he considered to be a swamp rescue vehicle. Where's Roebling living at the time? Well, he's living on the Gulf Coast of Florida, close to Tampa. And the, he lives in a town called Clearwater, but the reason he's wealthy has to do with a lot to do with his engineering inclinations and aptitude. Uh, Roebling's family had already constructed the Brooklyn Bridge. They were engineers, inventors, had built steel cable suspension systems and pioneered their construction. And so young Roebling retired to Florida. And there in the 1930s, in the midst of the Great Depression, there were a series of hurricanes that displaced people and stranded them in the middle of swamps. And what Roebling came to appreciate was that it was difficult for rescuers to, say, drive a truck through swampy terrain or to get a boat through some of the mangrove root systems. And as a result, people died that didn't necessarily need to die for want of a rescue amphibian. And so Roebling took his own money and invested in building this contraption. An earlier model is in the backdrop and then later models which he would cannibalize and improve uh, continuing uh, designs. Ultimately, um, this vehicle is built for saving people in the Everglades, for saving people in Lake Okeechobee. It's, it's not for military purpose. That's not his vision. So happens that Life magazine portrayed a several page uh, display of Roebling's contraption diving off the seawall off of Tampa Bay, or into the Tampa Bay, of climbing up in the swamps and around rugged terrain. And lo and behold, the fellow who reads it is a Navy Admiral in San Diego. And that Admiral had been working with the Marine Corps for, for some years on landing processes, on, on, on amphibious operations. And he was alert to the possibility the Marines could make use of this. So what does he do? He passes his copy of life over to a Marine Corps general, a fellow named General Lewis McCarty Little, and he says, hey, this might be what you're looking for. And what does General Little do? He sends it to Headquarters Marine Corps in Washington, D.C. He says, hey, we need to investigate this Roebling design. It could be the alternative for the Christie vehicle we never built. And so Life magazine opened up a new door. And ultimately, know that at precisely the same time that Life magazine would, would publish this expose, uh, the, the Japanese, Im Imperial Japanese forces were in the midst of conquering Shanghai, invading China in a goal to conquer it. So if anything, the, the acute sensitivity to the prospect of war in Asia was inflamed at the very moment that uh, Japan is invading China and then the Marines understand that there might be a technical solution to this ongoing unresolved problem. How do you cross a coral reef at low tide? The challenge, of course, was how do you convince somebody to make a war machine if they hadn't made it for that purpose? The team that actually arrived uh, at, at, at Donald Roebling's estate in, in, in Clearwater, Florida, discovered that Roebling was more than happy to talk to the Marine Corps. He was very cordial, but he didn't want to turn his machine into a war machine. He had built this for swamp rescue, not for carrying uh, soldiers or Marines ashore. And so he demurred. But a year later, 
as war clouds continued to darken into 1938 and to 39. Uh, and it was obvious that war in Europe, or war was engulfing Europe. It had already engulfed parts of Africa. It was stretching across China. Roebling consented to allow the Navy and the Marine Corps to use his design with the goal of mass producing it. The challenge was he'd built one. Yeah, he built several prototypes, but he'd just built one. And when the Navy approached him and said, why, why is it nine feet, ten inches wide? Because the Navy's always concerned about the dimensions of craft and whether they can fit in the holds of cargo ships, whether they have cranes that can support the weight of a particular vehicle or craft and lower it down, or whether there's an elevator big enough to, to help it, uh, to, to basically put it into the sea. Roebling answered that question fairly simply. Uh, it's nine feet, ten inches wide because the gates of my, my at, outside my uh, estate are, are ten feet, and the, the gate that my garage is opening is ten feet wide. So I've got to drive it in there. I need a little inch on each side. And he's serious. So in that sense, Roebling's understanding of, of design was very much like what we could call uh, a Silicon Valley in, uh, designer building, say, a computer in their garage. Roebling's built the amphibian tractor in his garage. He's tested it in his swimming pool. He's tested it off his beachfront estate. It's very much a scratch-built endeavor. He doesn't even have blueprints. Where's he got the parts? Where's he got the talent to build it? Well, he has some of it himself, but he orders parts out of automotive catalogs. He contracts with a local firm to scratch-build other machinery that he needs. He hires a team of engineers and spends a lot of money in the Great Depression, I might add. Now, with respect to this vehicle, uh, Roebling's built one. And I've highlighted in the bottoms of the slide that, that once war explodes in Europe, shortly after Poland is conquered by, by, by Nazi forces and by, by the Soviets too, uh, the Bureau of Ships allocates money for the Marine Corps to acquire one. One vehicle. That's it. One. Over the next year, as things darken even more, uh, the Bureau of Ships and Roebling will agree to build 200. The challenge is he has no clue how to build them. He signs the paperwork without a, any idea whatsoever of how do I make 200 in my garage. The challenge then for the Navy and for Roebling is to actually deliver on the contract. Will 200 be enough? Probably not. So this pathway of mass production uh, was initiated in part due to the observation of one officer of something in Life magazine. Was it inevitable that the Marine Corps would actually have an amphibian tractor? By no means. You could call it chance or providence. Ultimately, we need to figure out this dynamic of why the Navy would choose to invest in the amphibian tractor. Clearly, for 20 years, the Marine Corps had made a point that it wanted to have something like this, and the Navy had proved indifferent. By the time of 1941, by the time of 1941, Nazi forces controlled the continent of Europe. And it was clearly evident to the, the, the Navy at this point that if they're going to find their way uh, in Europe again, they have to, the American forces will have to fight their way ashore. So the Navy comes to appreciate the need for specialized landing craft and landing vehicles and the needs of projecting power ashore. It's a lot more acute at this moment. And it so happens that at precisely this moment, the budget skyrockets. Defense appropriations in the United States go from uh, hovering in the realm of about a billion to more than six billion dollars virtually overnight. So the Navy has money to spend and it has the awareness that it needs to provide its amphibious forces the means to get ashore. But how do you mass produce something? Especially when the one design that you have has been scratch built in a garage. Enter a food machinery corporation or FMC. And this map here depicts basically FMC's operations, its various industrial plants and facilities at about this very time. Donald Roebling had worked with FMC in the 1930s to scratch build some of these parts for his prototypes. Now what is FMC? Food machinery, I might add, with headquarters and operations in Citrus Grove, rich places such as Florida and Southern California especially also. What it builds is pesticide sprayers, irrigation equipment, uh, machines to harvest and pick fruit and to package them. 
But Roebling has a pre-existing relationship with FMC. They have a small facility in Dunedin, Florida, which is really close to Clearwater. And so he and the Navy approach FMC. You're a corporation. You have factories. You mass produce things. Could you retool, perhaps, and build a war machine? You never provided defense contracts before or met any defense needs or built a vehicle. Could you do it? And to his credit, Paul Davies, the then president of FMC, depicted in the upper left, Paul Davies saw an opportunity to serve the nation and to serve FMC's interests as well, its shareholders. And so Paul Davies said, sure, we can build this thing. We'll partner with Roebling and the Navy. We'll mass produce the Landing Vehicle Tract, or LVT, the Amtrak, as it came to be called. Davies appreciated that FMC had no experience in building vehicles. He has a few uh, key people that work up in the industrial belt in, 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 in facilities such as in Lansing, Michigan, but he will hire people out of the automotive industry to help FMC develop these mass production techniques and to develop the resident expertise one would need to build war machinery. But one of the key misconceptions about war production is usually that you can only do one of two things. It's this or that, either or. You can do guns or butter. Now, in the case of FMC, in one sense, it's involved in the butter industry. It's involved in agriculture. What's striking about it, the way in which FMC mobilized for amphibian tractor construction is that it didn't stop its agricultural production business whatsoever. It did both, and this is how. One of its new factories it would build in, in Lakeland, Florida, specifically to build uh, an amphi amphibian tractor designs. It added to its factory in Dunedin to build amphibian tractors. And in the clearest case of guns and butter, in Riverside, California, in Southern California, the FMC factory would actually build an entirely new factory for amphibian tractor production on exactly the opposite side of the rail line that ran right up to the back of the food machinery corporation warehouse. So in other words, the FMC had always built its factories close to a rail line so it could simply offload equipment that it had manufactured, put them on rail cars, and ship them away. But in this case, when it got its war contracts from the Navy, it built new factories just on the opposite side. So it expanded its operations and was able to actually do both. In fact, from the federal government, it received tax breaks. They had to file what are called certificates of necessity and such. Uh, and these would facilitate industrial mobilization for war purposes, where companies that did not necessarily make war machines could entertain the costs and minimize the costs of starting a war machines business. And that's just what FMC will do. Now, with respect to this elaborate network of just FMC production, the Navy appreciated that FMC, to its best interest, could never build all of the vehicles envisioned. And so they found other prime contractors, like the St. Louis Car Corporation, uh, the, the, the Borg Warner Corporation, among others. Uh, FMC was always the primary uh, lead in this field of development, but there were other major manufacturers that would build amphibian tractors. Of course, there's hundreds and hundreds of subcontractors that filled these specialized parts needs, transmissions, radiators, clutches, uh, and the like. And of course, a whole elaborate network of raw materials providers, too. It was really up to the, the Navy, however, to figure out how to ensure that this system of supply and procurement actually worked well. Now, with respect to production, one of the challenges in the midst of all of this was could the Navy and the Marine Corps actually get what they want in the time that they need it in anticipation of future operations? One of the challenges for all industrial operations in World War II, for the United States and other warring powers, was providing the necessary workplaces uh, to create the talented workforce, the specialized workers that could do the work, um, to allocate the appropriate machine tools, because if you don't have certain lathes and other equipment for casting and such, you can't make these uh, enough equipment. And so finding the, the critical resources, human and otherwise, to actually construct specialized machines was of the utmost importance. But the challenge for the government as a whole, the US government as well as, uh, as, as every other war government, was to identify which people to conscript and not 
which people to allow to volunteer in the armed forces and not. And then the case of my grandfather there in the middle and his brother Tommy, uh, just before the war they just, they're working in an automotive uh, shop, they're mechanics, and they choose to join the Marine Corps. But the question that their very lives suggests is would they have been better served working in an FMC plant, perhaps, than joining the Marine Corps and serving basically as ground infantry? All warring governments had to make those decisions about who not to let serve in uniform. Whether you worked in a creamery, whether you worked in a lumber mill, there were a host of specialized civilian fields that necessitated continuing production. And FMC's very experience of doing both, guns and butter, suggests how the U.S. government tried to balance military need with ongoing domestic priorities also. Farm tractors will always be one of the top ten programs during World War II for U.S. war production, domestic farm tractors. Out of the appreciation that you need to feed your own people to keep the war effort functioning. And historians such as Richard Overy have identified that one of the reasons the Allies, it seems that, that the Allies will win World War II, is because they better formulate their war economies for an endurance, long-term affairs, by minimizing the hardships civilians encounter so that there's well-fed people, there's, there's abundant resources, uh, the challenge is ultimately it takes a long time to, to do well both. In the, in the, uh, the pictures of the amphibian tractor, there's Donald Roebling near the front of his vehicle in Tampa Bay. But the challenge then is how do you take that one design and then turn it into a vehicle for war? Can you do it in time? Do you have the right people in place? Those are other complexities to this production puzzle. How do you know what you're building is the best thing that you could build? This particular backdrop photo is actually of another amphibian design. It's not a tractor, it's a wheeled amphibian. Designed by a New Orleans shipbuilder, undoubtedly you've heard of him, his name is Andrew Higgins. And the Higgins boat would be one, become one of the, the mainstays of America's amphibious forces. Uh, Tom Hanks would storm off the beaches off of a, onto German-held beaches to defeat Hitler uh, in Saving Private Ryan from a Higgins boat. Higgins was a, an industrial entrepreneur, more successful than Christie, but interested, in, if anything, in, in, in patriotic as well as profit-based motivations. Christie's not looking, or er, Roebling's not looking to make a buck. But Higgins, when approached by a Marine Corps officer uh, depicted here named Victor Krulak, then a captain in the Marines, would ultimately become a lieutenant general, but Krulak would identify in these early model amphibian tractors, like the ones in the inset picture there off the coast of Guadalcanal, uh, that the suspension was, was, was problematic. They were prone to overheating, uh, these vehicles were. They broke down too quickly. In other words, there were a host of deficiencies with Roebling's early designs. And so when Krulak was discussing these with Higgins in New Orleans, he said, well, maybe uh, instead of a track to design, because there's so many moving parts in which sand can infiltrate and jam up the, the, the roller bearings and such, and, uh, could you build a, a wheeled vehicle? And Higgins on his own dime will do that. He builds several prototypes. And the photograph up here depicts ultimately one of the trials that uh, some of the Higgins Industries uh, a agents and, and uh, members of the armed forces were, were investigating the vehicle. The challenge for Higgins at this moment, he's got a design, and by all reports, the Navy and the Marine Corps identify his design as superior, superior to Donald Roebling's. Can you switch gears? And the Navy decided it could not. By 1942, it had already invested too much in the blueprints and the processes for industrial mobilization, mass production of Roebling's amphibian tractor. This is what I would call standardizing obsolescence. You know it's deficient, you know it's got problems, you're not going to solve all of them in Model 1.0, but in order to have any quantity of anything, you need to start building. And that's precisely what the Bureau of Ships and FMC will choose to do, to build vehicles they know are deficient, but better than nothing. Higgins's designs, for all their promise, are never built. And Krulak explained uh, to me years ago, he said, well, the reason being is, as much as I had hoped that Higgins's design could replace this one, the reason that it doesn't is because we couldn't make this shift in design philosophy. We just couldn't shift gears that much. 
Now, in the midst of building all of this, one of the complexities also is not just building final product, but how many spare parts do you need? Ultimately, the Navy concludes that for every 25 amphibian tractors, you need a, basically another one, just full of spares, to cannibalize and to replenish things that are breaking. And so it wasn't just a question of final production. It's also a question of how many spare parts, how much training, how much investment have you paid into this particular industrial program. And the Navy concluded, no Higgins, amphibian. Who in the Navy makes these decisions? I'd like to introduce you to a fellow named Commander George Preifold. Preifold fell into an interesting position as an individual uh, called a supervisor of shipbuilding. Now we don't hear about supervisors of shipbuilding in, in the grand tales of naval history in World War II. We hear about battles such as Midway or, or the Coral Sea or, or such. But Preifold was ultimately tasked to a desk job, stateside, where he worked for the duration of the war. And what his job was, was ultimately to be the liaison between the Bureau of Ships and FMC and the other contractors to actually build the amphibian tractor. His job was literally to translate the strategic requirements, such as we, we anticipate that we need 5,000 of these or 10,000 of these, these vehicles in anticipation of the next campaign season where we're going to rip into the Central Pacific or march from the Southwest Pacific forward. We need a certain quantity. And Preifold would articulate that and work with FMC and its designers, its corporate bosses, to adjudicate their concerns and mass produce such things. Preifold, just by way of illustration, I, I, I found Preifold by looking through Bureau of Ships records and seeing his name come up again and again and again and was intrigued by how influential he was. So I reached out and found his daughter, who provided me his photograph here. Uh, and the photograph in back is one signed by his boss, who is in charge of the entire Navy's amphibian tractor program. And what it is is a picture of a particular island called Tarawa. Marines are ashore at Tarawa. And what it says here is, Dear George, you may enjoy sharing with me the satisfaction of these Marines at Tarawa. Your most outstanding contribution toward developing the alligator as the Amtrak was often called, and its progeny were a most important factor in putting them on Pacific Islands. So in other words, if it wasn't for you, we don't win. If it's not for the home front and this harmony of translating strategic requirements into industrial production, the United States doesn't win war in the Pacific. It's up to individuals reconciling, negotiating, providing the liaison services between industry and the armed forces to ensure that things were built according to the needs that the services identified. And there are a few other kinds of jobs. One's called an inspector of material. These would be often Navy personnel assigned to factories. Sometimes they had their offices in these factories and they would work in concert with, uh, with, with engineers and draftsmen and others who are literally designing these vehicles to identify what the defects were and moreover what they should do about them. Are these things that need to be fixed now or fixed in the next model? the next production run, maybe six to eight months to 12 months from now. Those are all the kinds of questions that the home front uniformed officers and industrialists had to, to answer. Guess what? The presumption is that lessons learned in the field actually made a difference in vehicle design back home. And you would hope that that would be the case, that if you identified, if, if troops in the field detected problems with these vehicles, or any vehicle or weapon system, that, that their reports would find satisfaction and answers by factory designers that would make better models. Truth be known, in the case of the amphibian tractor, and I suspect it's the case with most vehicle designs, the individuals who best appreciated its weaknesses were the designers. They knew their inadequacies keenly, but in the interest of mass production, they had to table certain ad advances that they couldn't resolve quite yet. We'll work on that, but for the moment, we're going to produce this line of this vehicle. And so the designers were already anticipating the service needs, and the, and the folks in the field would say, ah, well, this, is, this vehicle breaks down, it's prone to this, it's, it has this problem, and they'd file these detailed reports after most major operations such as at Tarawa, say, well, you know, we need more armor, we need more armament, we need more lifespan and reliability, we need all of these things. And lo and behold, the people building these had already put those, those improvements into motion in a subsequent design. 
There's another group of, of institutions we could call training centers. One built right by Donald Roebling's estate in Florida, where the Navy and the Marine Corps established its first amphibian tractor school to teach officers and crew how to operate these things and operate them well. And it's at these training schools, kind of like driver's training, where you could imagine in a driver's training car the, the transmission and the brakes are ruined on account of, of immature drivers. And the training centers also are these experimental laboratories for beating the snot out of the amphibian tractor and discovering what works well and, and what doesn't. So collectively, the home front, the training schools, as well as the factories themselves, had already identified practically every material problem with the amphibian tractor and were already working towards solutions when they received the requests from the troops in the field that said, could you do this please? It might save some lives. Tarawa was a particular battle in November 1943. It's just a three-day battle, and I say just. It was intense and ferocious. But what it represented was America's first amphibious assault in the Central Pacific against a heavily defended Japanese garrison, numbering almost 5,000 crack troops. And the reason to take this island was to build a runway to pepper uh, and, and weaken the next island chain called the Marshalls. Now it's here where the Marines have a grand total of 125 of these vehicles that they've scratched together. And there they discover that that's not enough, or barely enough. The margin of, of survivability was, was grim at Tarawa. Ninety or so of these 125 vehicles were damaged or knocked out by enemy action. What they did, though, was they carried the first three waves of assault troops ashore. And so at that moment, the amphibian tractor had shifted from basically in the minds of the Marines as an ocean-going truck to carry supplies. And yeah, you could carry troops, but not as an assault vehicle. But they shifted it at Tarawa to include this particular vehicle in an assault role. And it worked quite well. It crossed the coral reef at low tide, delivered the Marines to the seawall, and there they ultimately fought to overcome the Japanese garrison. But at Tarawa, the lore has always been that as a result of these after-action reports from the amphibian tractor battalion there and such, that ultimately the Navy would mass-produce these and deliver newer models like the one I'm standing in front of there nearby the FMC factory in Riverside, or what was the FMC factory there. They said, we could really use some firepower. Can you put a tank turret on some of these? We could really use more armor. We could use a lot more Amtraks, hundreds more. And guess what? Three months later, at the, in the campaign to open the Marshalls, uh, island, the Marshall Islands, um, the Marines have exactly that uh, afforded to them. They have hundreds more Amtraks. They have new models like this one called the LVT-A1. Uh, in other words, they get exactly what they requested, and they're thrilled. People listen to their complaints, and Uncle Sam responded. But as I started to investigate that as a possibility, I thought, well, is it plausible that at the end of November 1943, that reports from the Central Pacific could reach Washington, D.C. and spread out to the designers in these various locations, such as in Florida. Produce a change in, in, in their vehicle design, retool them, make new ones, and actually package them on ships and send them back into the Central Pacific within three months. Train crews had to use these, and the answer is no. Truth be known, the very vehicles, the armored and armed versions that the Marines were, were requesting, were already built, were already uh, at, at the landing uh, depots or the, the, base, the supply depots on the west coast of the United States. They're all packaged, ready to go for the next invasion. It's just they weren't available for this one. But that notion of cause and effect in battle one, we don't have them in battle two, and we asked for them in battle two, we do. It must have been because we said something. And it had nothing to do with that whatsoever. It had to do with the fact that these vehicles often would take at least a year to design and build, at least, if not 18 months or more. So you couldn't do it in a three-month interval, despite the impression notwithstanding. Let's shift from production to issues of deployment. One of the challenges throughout this process of designing an entirely new and innovative vehicle was, uh, could you actually make it work? Who would determine if it does work in the ways in which you want it to work? And here we can see in the upper left, uh, again, uh, this fellow named Victor Krulak. 
a young Marine, Naval Academy graduate, uh, who got assigned to test the earliest model alligator uh, in uh, the Caribbean, off the coast of Puerto Rico. He's one of the first to validate that this could actually float, it could work in the sea, and maybe deliver Marines ashore. And he and the, the, the sergeants below him were those who, who tooled around in this and, and, and understood that it could be useful. And their reports would have an influence in helping the Navy to determine to mass produce it. But one of the unanswered challenges was, could this vehicle really work in heavy Pacific surf? Like the kinds you might see in those surfing competitions off the coast of Hawaii or where have you, where massive, massive waves could be generated, slamming into coral reefs. And the challenge for the Marines is they're looking at the Central Pacific in early 1943 and envisioning what the complexities might entail. They wanted to ensure that this particular vehicle could actually withstand the battering damage of heavy waves and real coral reefs. And so Krulak was actually pulled out of a particular job in the Western Pacific and, and reassigned to test this vehicle off the coast uh, of, of Noumea. And uh, and basically his orders were, destroy your vehicle, drive it to the point it breaks apart, see what the limits of it, uh, see what its limits are, how survivable it really is. And, and he writes about this in his, his biography and in a few other places, um, but I had the opportunity to ask him, well, what was that like? Because he didn't really reveal much about the experience beyond, I tested it in the heavy surf. And he said, I was scared to death. Freddie drowned, uh, tossed around inside the, the, the crew compartment, uh, and he and his, his uh, cargo mates or crewmates were black and blue with bruises and beaten to smithereens, but they validated that this thing could actually negotiate heavy surf, smashing into coral, and survive. But that report never made it to the forces getting ready for Tarawa. And so the forces getting ready for Tarawa conducted their own trials in Fiji where they basically went through the exact same process. And so somewhere along the lines, these reports don't always make it to where they ought to go, but collectively the Marine Corps would validate the idea that this truck idea could actually be upgraded into an assault amphibian. Why make it an assault vehicle? Because you don't know with any predictability what the tidal depths will be. You could study them all you want, but on any given day, American intelligence officers could not conclude with any distinct determination, any definitive answer, whether the tides would be sufficient for the Higgins boats to cross or not. And if they're not, you're going to be stuck at the, at the reef's edge. And good luck. Your assault will fail. American strategy in the Pacific will fall apart. And so validating the idea that this vehicle could then be upgraded, armored, and, and ultimately designed to uh, fight its way ashore was one that individuals like Krulak and others uh, would establish. But as much as individuals were determining the, the operational parameters, the tactical utility and usefulness of certain uh, amphibian tractors, it was really up to the schools, these training centers, uh, established in hotels like the one in the upper right uh, in Dunedin, Florida, not far from Donald Roebling's estate. Once the Navy chooses to mass produce this vehicle, the Marines had to establish a training regimen, a program, and a battalion. And from that kernel, that seed bed in which uh, a fellow here named Victor Kreuzat, one of the most influential historians of this era, um, a really decent fellow. Um, but Victor Kreuzat uh, was, was part of the initial battalion. And that battalion would begat other battalions as trained officers and crew would be farmed out to be the, the skeletal staff for newly forming battalions. And there they'd transmit what they had learned uh, to, to, uh, to these newer units. Um, but it's at these schools where they would really test these concepts and figure out how to work uh, these particular vehicles. Uh, by way of branding, one of the things Roebling does, and he's, he has a critical role in all of this still. Just because FMC's building it doesn't mean he doesn't retain an interest, and he does. And he'll sit on the floor with blueprints around him as they're being fleshed out to try and figure out ways of improving subsequent models. Uh, and, and that was one of the memories Kreuzot had for the rest of his life was seeing Roebling, who's a large individual sitting down and thumbing through things to try and uh, literally figure out solutions uh, with, you could say, chalk on the floor. Um, but Roebling took the Caterpillar tractor logo 
and adapted it to his own uh, with, uh, with more of a Floridian theme, we could say, in the form of the alligator. Ultimately, when these forces are deployed, these battalions that would get established at such places as Florida, uh, how would the Marine Corps and the Navy work together to ensure that they actually had the necessary units in place, uh, properly staffed, properly equipped, well, it was a, and when they would need it. It was a real challenge to orchestrate production, in part because, as we mentioned a, a while ago, FMC discovered often it couldn't provide enough vehicles at any given time. And so collectively, there is an effort to shift and reallocate resources, such as to pull Amtraks from one region and, and move them to another, to uh, combine units together. Uh, in the case of, of, of battlefield attrition, there were too many losses, and so they would form new battalions. Um, and so as a whole, the, the senior leadership tried to find the best way of maintaining combat power, even when it was unpredictable how much they might actually have. One of the, the, the innovations that amphibian tractor crew and officers developed uh, throughout the war was, one of these was to discover that it could be well used as in a, an assault vehicle, <coughs> lead the charge. Another was actually that if you're leading troops in, well, you could probably take them out. And in a medevac capacity to evacuate wounded uh, soldiers and Marines. The challenge with evacuating troops on these was, is there going to be a ship with a hospital bay waiting off the coast for you or not? And in some of the early operations where the Navy and the Marines hadn't firmly established these relationships, the ships had moved on and uh, the Amtraks would churn out into the water and, and search around for a ship that wasn't there. Uh, and so, of course, uh, with, with a variety of human consequences, um, they would work to harmonize that. Uh, another role that the amphibian tractor played that was somewhat unanticipated was that in muddy jungle terrain, such as in Bougainville uh, in late 1943, or in Okinawa, such as E.B. Sledge would record uh, in his With the Old Breed, uh, when, when mud prevented the use of wheeled vehicles, uh, tracked vehicles, such as the Amtrak, played a vital role in carrying and distributing supplies. And so the, the, the individuals in responsible for, for defeating the Japanese garrisons uh, identified the amphibian tractor as, as especially useful inland as well as getting to shore to begin with. Another role was also what we call fire support. Yes, the version with the tank turret uh, that we saw me standing in front of a while ago, uh, that would be useful for riding to the beach and blasting apart enemy pillboxes and, and coastal fortifications where they existed. Uh, but another model we'll see in a moment would be, uh, would provide what we call indirect fire support through basically functioning as a, as a piece of artillery. But that was up to the individual initiative of the commander of that unit to say, well, I think I could incline my barrel in such a way it could s function like artillery, but I haven't been trained as an artillerist, nor have my crew, so I need to learn how to do artillery fire support missions. And so this cross-training purpose was particularly useful. Certain island campaigns and certain battles, uh, amphibian tractors like this, the, where, where even the early models they'd break down, say at Guadalcanal pretty early, well the crew would be allocated. They're all trained as infantry. And they would harvest what they could use from these vehicles in the form of especially machine guns to augment and enhance the firepower of the ground forces to withstand uh, human waves of assaults by Japanese forces at Guadalcanal. So in a whole variety of ways on land and at sea and on that interface between, amphibian tractors proved extraordinarily useful. So I would argue that this vehicle would provide what we could call a means to an end. It very much would permit American forces to fulfill their strategic ambition, which was to cross the Pacific in a timely fashion to defeat the Empire of Japan. It allowed American forces to cross coral reefs. It allowed them to do other things on islands themselves and to minimize the losses American forces incurred. Uh, and just by way of re refreshing, in January of 1940, about two years before Pearl Harbor, the Navy had contracted to build just one of these Donald Roebling designs. Roebling's here in the inset picture. February of 1941, uh, a year later, the Bureau of Ships was envisioning uh, 200 but that suggests a limit to its imagination because shortly thereafter, contract after contract after contract would be signed between FMC and a host of other providers and, and, and construction firms. 
uh, such that more than 18,000 of these would be built, basically between 1942, truly, and 1945, of a variety of different designs and models. And here's the one with the, the short-barreled artillery piece, basically a 75 millimeter cannon. But collectively, that production would suggest the diversity and the richness of American industrial mobilization. To scratch build something, seemingly out of the air, to mass produce it, and to harness its potential as combat power for forces deploying in far distant and difficult terrain. Uh, Roebling for his accomplishments and his contribution would be uh, the recipient of, a, of an award by President Truman at the end of World War II for uh, his indispensable contributions to victory in the Pacific. Uh, subsequently, the Marine Corps has acknowledged Roebling by giving uh, an acquisitions award in, in defense procurement, uh, named after Roebling. And so Roebling remains an icon in many ways, but a minor figure as we popularly know him to be. And we often see these vehicles, we often see pictures of things in, in, in battlefield use, but, but I'd suggest rarely do we think about how they get there and how the concepts for anticipating their use, their organization, uh, the optimizing their, their battlefield effectiveness are actually developed. And this is just the tip of the spear in so many ways. So why don't I close now and open it up uh, to questions. We've got about 10 minutes or so. Uh, Trey. So what role, um, and this could be particularly in the Pacific, what role did uh, technological superiority play when it came to the combat operations from Tarawa onward? Did that play a significant role? Because it doesn't seem to be the case that we were ever repulsed as the Japanese would have hoped? It's a great question. Um, in many ways, the, the, arm, the amphibious forces of the United States, whether it be Marine or, or Army, uh, would demonstrate increased proficiency uh, throughout the war. And Tarawa provided a lot of, uh, you could say, lessons about how to do that job better of an uh, amphibious assault. But the Japanese recalibrate too. The Japanese would discover that if you leave your troops along the beach <laughs> in concentration, uh, the Americans are going to blast them into smithereens. And so what we'll see is that as, as American forces become correspondingly more lethal and proficient, in part because of better technology, but also in part because of better training and prowess and familiarity with how all of these moving parts fit together better. better. Uh, the Japanese also changed their tactics, too, to move inland and dig deeper uh, and, and wait for Americans to come to them. And so it's much more of, I'd say, a dialogue than demonstrating absolute superiority. Although, of course, the Japanese would fight to, uh, fight to the point where they're extinguished on practically all of these islands. Uh, yes? When, how early were they uh, armoring these vehicles, like, like the models used in Tarawa? Like, how up-armored were those? Uh, not very well. Uh, the ones that are allocated to Tarawa, that initial 125, uh, once it became obvious that they're going to be used in this assault role, uh, the Marines on New Zealand, where they were staging, uh, searched for anything that could be strapped on or attached or welded onto the, the front of, uh, of the holes. Uh, and so they had about a, just about a half inch uh, of, of armor, um, but it wasn't designed to be sort of integrated in that way, and so it was the best that they could do. Um, but there's already a design, the, 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 the one with the, the 37 millimeter tank turret, the, the narrower barrel, and then other models of, of passenger Amtraks that had already incorporated armor on them, and they were much more reliable, and, and, and the passengers could arrive in, in better array. Oh, question in the back. Yeah, why? Uh, with the uh, Higgins uh, design for the mm. wheeled yes. um, uh, amphibious vehicle, did they, uh, did they, because uh, I know there was a, something uh, called the Duck mm -hmm. that was used mostly in Europe. Uh, was that based on the designs or? No, but you could say not, not directly, but they're closely interrelated. There's a host of differing, you could say, industrial solutions to the problems of flotation and crossing a beach. One of these was called a Duck, uh, which is this wheeled amphibian, almost elongated, kind of looks like a boat with wheels. And some of you may have opportunities if you go to San Francisco or other port cities to take a ride on a duck. I mean, there are these uh, tourist operations that still drive ducks. Um, the challenge for the duck, uh, with, with coral reefs specifically, 
was the idea that the reef would puncture and rip apart the wheels, uh, whereas the metal drummed wheels that Higgins is building would, be, would not be able to be punctured or there'd be sufficient buoyancy, even if they were, that, that the vehicle could keep churning along. Uh, and so the duck was one of these vehicles. Uh, it's used in the Pacific too, um, but, but often as, as a truck, if you will, rather than as an assault vehicle. It didn't have the defensive capabilities that a lot of the Amtraks uh, possessed. Um, yes, Trey? So how, and, I, and maybe, maybe, maybe not easy, but mm -hmm. what was the process like if, if, say, they needed to switch contractors? So I know, say, for instance, in World War I, when, when Colt was asked to provide, to provide weapons and they ended up, for a significant period of time, not producing anything, um, so they had to find other methods. Was the process still the same? How would they go about doing that if a contractor did not uh, provide? Well, and, and this, this is a constant and ever-going problem, uh, that, uh, that as best as you could, uh, some of these companies couldn't provide what they, what they pledged to, what they had arranged to by contract. Uh, the way that the Navy accommodated that possibility was by securing basically about a half a dozen prime contractors that could potentially uh, improve or uh, enlarge their production should another fall short. Um, and in, in, in truth, none of them could really uh, change what they were doing uh, on the cuff. And so as a whole, if, if somebody fell behind, it just meant that that, that month's production quota uh, was less than ideal. And correspondingly, you've got fewer in the field. Other questions? Yes? Oh. So for the case of logistics, um, how did they find uh, kind of the rough number of projected ships that they might need for uh, assault, for supply, logistics. I know this is kind of a, a new technology, a new field. What were they using as kind of their base? Well, initially they don't have any firm numbers whatsoever. The expectation was that on average an amphibian tractor battalion structure would have about 95 to 100 vehicles or thereabouts, and that that could carry uh, a good portion of, uh, of, of the assault infantry from a particular division ashore. Wouldn't necessarily be able to carry it all. Right. And so it was recognized that ultimately, in order to carry, say, one or two division or three divisions worth of assault infantry, the, the fellows you need ashore first, uh, in an assault, uh, that really you need somewhere in the realm of no less than 500 Amtraks or, or upwards of five different battalion structures. And so realizing that not only do you need lots of numbers, but that you need lots of replacements too, because they're going to inevitably be losses. So that's where suddenly in 1940, early 43, you see contracts for, for more than 3,000 let, and then soon that number is doubled and doubled again. And as a result, that's where you get that 18,000 figure uh, is out of that sort of learning process that they're going to take losses. M moreover, you can't allocate all production to the field. You need a certain amount in these training schools. And, and there are other reasons you might need them as well. There are a few allocated to the European theater, but by and large, practically the whole of American amphibian tractor production was focused in the Pacific, chiefly because of that coral reef complexity. Let's see, yes, Hunter. So with, um, oh. Oh. so with the the amphibious like tanks and tractors going on, I know like the Marine Corps also had Shermans in the Pacific Theater. So which ones did the Marine Corps prefer? Ah, uh, well, the Marine Corps would in the question of of would you prefer a tank as a tank or an amphibian as an amphibian? The challenge with the amphibian tractor is it's not good as a boat and it's not good as an armored vehicle. It's both. And so its hybrid characteristics meant that it was less efficient as a tank. It couldn't have as much armor. It wasn't configured in quite the same way that a land vehicle could optimally be designed, nor as a boat. Uh, but it had the, the, the two qualities kind of blended together. So on land operations where the Marines could have tanks, they would prefer tanks. And where the Amtraks do serve in fire support missions and to help the infantry ashore, uh, they do take uh, disproportionate casualties because they're, they're higher than they optimally need to be and they don't have quite the defensive characteristics that a, that a tank would. Um, but, but the challenge in part with the tank is could you get the tank ashore? 
in, in, at that moment at where the amphibian tractors leading the van and the armored ones with the tank turrets would all lead the assaults in the, in the 44, 45. So in this case, like with this one right here, yes. they would use these ones to soften up the defensive on the beach, but they when the assault's over, they just go back to the boat. Uh, ideally so, although a lot of the, the, the they call the LVTA-4, and we'll have to conclude our, our questions uh, for the sake of time, but a lot of this, th these models would stay on, uh, on land, uh, in part because they're not carrying troops around. Uh, they would provide that organic, uh, indirect fire support artillery role. Uh, and the challenge with this particular model in its infancy is, uh, in contrast to the earlier tank model, it's not gyroscopically stabilized. So, as you can only imagine, bobbing and weaving in the surf, how inaccurate that fire might be, uh, but it has a very powerful round, uh, like the Marine Corps medium tank would, uh, and so it could destroy just about anything it encountered, especially in the form of Japanese tanks. So on that note, thank you very much. I will see you on Thursday. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. at midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.